Hi, everybody. Guess who's here? Guess. No, really, guess. Okay, you can. Brian Baumgartner. Bar Baum Baumgartner. Brian. Hi, Brian. Hi, how are you, Mar <laughs> Emeritus? How are you? <laughs> Margaret. Say Margaret. Mar Everyone does. Margaret? <laughs> No, I it's think Meredith. I, no, I think I think I was I think that's what I was going to say. Right, because well, Margaret Atwood Atwood I, wrote I, the handmaid. Her book is tale. right here. I know it's right here. Uh, yes. I call her uh, dear Aunt Margaret, but she's not my aunt. She's not. Well, you know, I uh, I get called specifically by Dan Hicks, who is a. Uh, I know you're in the world of sports. Uh, the the lead commentator for golf for NBC. They, uh, he always makes the mistake, and others they call me Bruce Baumgartner. Bruce, because interesting. Bruce Baumgartner uh, is maybe the most celebrated uh, wrestler in American <laughs> Olympic history. Yes, and you're so a wrestler, like a naturally, and I'm a wrestler exactly. So that's where the confusion comes. Clear. Well, so I interviewed. Um, oh gosh, Dustin. Milligan from Schitt's Creek and I I wrote it everywhere because I wanted to call him Justin Mulligan like every time I, I even the first time I posted it on Instagram I was like I'm so excited Justin Mulligan's here and my assistant was like what are you talking about who's oh Justin Mulligan gosh. I was like oh my gosh like what an amateur move but yeah. no Margaret yeah. Atwood I get all the time there's a guy in my CrossFit gym every morning hi Margaret and I just go well it's fine yes <laughs> It's totally fun. Well, well welcome to my little show. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for having me. So I, when I started podcasting 315 episodes ago, I did it for me, but now I do it to um, see if my kids will think I'm cool. So really, okay. you're just a pawn today for my <laughs> because my 13-year-old son was like, I bet you can't get Kevin from the office. And I was like, deal. Let's see if we can. So <laughs> thanks can. for being a pawn. I mean, it's absolutely <laughs> no for your kids. Anything for the kids. Anything. And for I the hear kids. you're a Georgia Bulldogs fan. Is that true? I am. I, in fact, I was listening to your accent trying to place it. Are you from Georgia? I am. I'm a Georgia Bulldog. Uh, oh, you went to Georgia. I went to Georgia. I'm a double dog. I went to undergrad and law school at Georgia. Wow. So one, you just slipped in that you're a smarty pants. And two, that, uh, yeah, <laughs> so smarty I, pants. I did not go there. I, um, but my, I grew up in Georgia and my, uh, my youth was spent in Athens. So <sighs> I, I would go uh, on Saturday morning, afternoon and and watch the Bulldogs play huge Bulldogs fan, still a Bulldog fan now, even though I, they didn't they didn't really have in college what I what I was looking for. But um, yeah, well, I have I, to uh, show you this. Let me see. And this will not mean anything to the audio people, but I have to share my screen with you because my son drew he's a little artist. He drew this bulldog on digital art. Very and, well done. Yeah. And so my grandmother, her thing was the Cardinals. And so he drew this for my mom. But um, when I saw you're a Georgia Bulldog fan, and since this is really just, you know, you're the pawn to prove to my son that I'm cool, like there's his art. So there's the little mom um, share. That's awesome. Although yes, <laughs> in this particular drawing, it looks like the Cardinal ha maybe has one up the Bulldog. So I don't know. How it I it really that, does. But... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. So I, of course, love The Office, but I had no idea. So I watched The Office when it came out. I actually, here's another fun fact for you. I went my first law school class. I would never talk about being a lawyer. I'm not Star Jones. Um, but in my first year, I was in class with a guy who's like, yeah, my cousin is in this new show called The Office. John Krasinski's cousin. I went to law school with him and we were like, oh, that's cool. We'll watch it. And so we all started watching it, my whole um, law school class. And so I naturally watched it all. And then I didn't. And then I didn't know there was so much lore in like, then your podcast, all this stuff about, I mean, the office will live forever. <laughs> It appears, it appears that way now. Yeah. I mean, so a crazy thing happened. I mean, I we need to were, change my location. Real oh, quick. there okay, it is. There it You're is. There, sorry. Right by the front, okay. by, right by the front door. Carry on. I haven't seen that one before. Um, 
Yeah. So, you know, we were, we were the number one scripted show on NBC for a large portion of the time that we were on after we were almost canceled multiple times. Uh, We were, but we were still like, we were a hit, but not like uh, huge. And then uh, with streaming, Netflix specifically, uh, more people found the show and we started finding younger people yes. um, like like your kids age, 13, yes. 14, uh, started finding the show. And, you know, then Nielsen started sort of releasing the numbers uh, for what the ratings were. And basically where we sit today, right, seven, eight years since we filmed anything, it's the most watched show in television. And that includes Shit's Creek that you mentioned, and a lot of uh, you know new shows on HBO and um, and and network shows, and and so for me, starting down uh, the podcast route was really truly based on a question, which was why why <laughs> like why why is this why is this happening right and and I, I've told this story many times, but you know, if you, if you know the story of The Office, we struggled mightily starting out. And what, what we always used to say, I mean, talk about openly was, you know, okay, this is about an office. So if we can get 200 million people in America work in offices, something like that. So it was like, well, if we could get 10% of those people, 5% <laughs> of those people to watch the show, we'll have a hit. And we truly did not think that we were making a show for young people, for people who were not in an office. Like it really was about capturing those people who we felt like understood the experience. And so for me going back now, so many years later and starting to talk to my, my old friends, actors and writers and producers and directors was really about what, why do we think this is like, what, what happened? What did we do right in the setup and the casting and the construction of the show? And I, a lot of people way smarter than me had some great <laughs> ideas, but I think that for me, the thing that really resonates as at least for one being true is that an unreasonable boss who talks or, or makes his employees do unreasonable things um, is, and, and is very similar to the experience of, of an unreasonable teacher making the students do unreasonable things, sitting next to people that maybe you don't want to sit next to. Okay. But year, yeah. after year after year, you're sort of, you know, quote unquote, stuck in this same environment with the same people, just getting, you know, just waiting, counting the minutes until you can get out. And, and I think that that experience of that and the characters, you know, the universality of the characters that existed on the show, you know, oh, certain traits reminds me of, you know, little Jimmy, you know, in junior high or whatever. Um, I, I That at least makes sense to me. Who knows? I have one producer who's like, it's funny. What's the problem? Like, that's why it's, people watch it. It's funny or whatever. Um, but I, th- I think that there's some, certainly some truth in the school thing. Yeah, yeah. And I obviously not smart enough to make that connection. <laughs> But either, but I mean, yeah, I should have asked my kid, like, why is this funny? But it is funny. I don't, so, you know, I, I feel like I don't need to say why is this funny? Cause I think it's funny. I think it's hilarious. <laughs> it's one of those shows that if you're walking through the room and it's on, you just, you know, five hours later, you're like, oh man, I was supposed to be doing something else. <laughs> my bad. Uh, yeah. Oh my gosh. I also think that there's a, I think that there's a subversive humor to it that appeals to younger people i don't know if that qualifies for 13 or whatever um but that you know there's a funny story because my i'm from the south and of course my parents they were huge fans of the show obviously (laughs) um but i remember one time like like going to visit them and talking about it and their you know my mom on Facebook or whatever, trying to get her friends to watch and all that. And she would say, my, oh, my, my friends, they can't watch it. They can't, they can't <laughs> watch it. Uh, Michael Scott, like he's just too horrible. He's so horrible. And, but there was a crazy 
thing where at the time, like in terms of big numbers, like in terms of like overall audience, probably the number one show on TV was, was the show CSI. If you remember CSI, yes, right? CSI. So I, I would, I said to my mom, I was like, well, you know, it's really interesting. Do they watch CSI? Oh yeah. They love CSI and CSI Albuquerque or whatever. And I'm like, okay. So it, they feel comfortable enough watching a show that opens, you know, 95% of the episodes with a mostly naked <laughs> girl, like strewn into the desert, just right. dead. And that's okay. But Steve, you know, but Michael Scott saying something that's a little bit uncomfortable, that makes you a little bit anxious, that is not. And I think in talking and going through the podcast and spending a lot of time with Greg Daniels, who, who created the American version of the show, the, the office and, and, and the producers, um, writers, directors, it was, we were going for sort of an ultra realism, right? Mm -hmm. So like that was the, one of their sort of mantras was truth and beauty, right? Everything needs to be true. And we need, and when something is true, there's always just, just a little something beautiful. And so that was what they were sort of aiming for. And there's something about that the reality of this, that the, the escapism right. of a CSI, you can sort of forgive some of those things that you don't necessarily see day to day, but the ultra realism, there's something about it that, you know, that, that makes some people uncomfortable. And so that's why I say sort of subversive humor in a way that if you get it, you get it. And if you don't, well, that's your problem or something. Yeah. I don't know. That's you can't look away. I mean, that's, yeah. that's exactly what it is. It's happening. And you're like, no, 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 no. This can't happen. Oh, it's happening. Oh God, what happens now? I mean, it's, that's what I feel like every time Michael opened his mouth, I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> like, what's about right. to happen here. Um, tell me because I'm, I do love the office, but I'm not, I'm clearly not at the level of some people with my trivia, but I was on YouTube last night and the welcome to Kevin Cook stuff in the office I'm your host, Kevin, the creme brulee. Like, was that on the show or was that something extra no. you did? Okay. No, no. So yeah, there, and that's the crazy thing about the show too. Like, so, I mean, there's a couple of things. One is that we, you know, we did quite a bit of improvising and the episodes were written very long, very dense. And so when they would assemble the episodes, the first like assembly and this is not like junk this is like okay here's the show would be like 43 44 minutes okay so for network television at the time this is pre obviously netflix and all that it it, it, it had to be cut down to like 22 and a half to 20 21 and a half to 22 minutes right, right? so half of it goes away just right there and you know, what we've found also is people aren't just consuming the show, but they're finding these deleted scenes that are getting released in certain places. And, and we also were, um, I mean, this like so dates me and the show, but, you know, at the time there was no TikTok, right? Or Instagram or, you know, all the social media stuff was in its infancy. And it was about NBC.com, like the website. We would produce materials in the summer for NBC.com, which, uh, you know, according to them, would would you know keep people talking about the show or whatever, and right. um, and would drive a large number of viewers. So we started doing. We called them webisodes at the time, and so we have several. Um, the accountants did. A, a, a webisode series. There was the Kevin Cook stuff in the office. I had another one, which is about a loan, getting a loan for ice cream. But <laughs> this became like, uh, it, it became like a big deal. And in fact, I, I won an Emmy for um, the, the, the first series we did, which was called The Accountants, which was me and Oscar and Angela. And we essentially produced 30 minutes of television broken up into 10, three minute, you know, now that seems like, well, that's what you do. You break it up and you see three minutes on YouTube or right. whatever. 
Um, but yeah, that was, that was, that was early days, but yes, there was a lot of, of, you know, deleted material and supplemental material that have sort of made its way out there now. How do you think it would have been different if the office had come out during the TikTok era? Like right now, right now the, the office launches, like what, what would happen? Tell me. Well, well, you know, it's funny. Yeah. Well, I learned this. So this is that this to me is just fascinating that in the very beginning before Steve Carell was hired and they were examining the character of Michael Scott right they were like well, wh- who is he what is he you know like how should he be and and a lot of it is is in relation to right the camera like the documentary crew that are there and the interaction between his character and right. the camera or whatever and Greg Daniels had this idea that he shared with with people i don't know if he shared it with steve or not but that he viewed the character of michael as how he viewed this documentary was if jennifer aniston watched the documentary he wanted to try to get a date with jennifer (laughs) like it was all about because this was coming out of friends right that's where the show came out yes was like oh if i can look really good and funny and smart and entertaining for the camera now of course he screwed it up left and right right like that's where part of the comedy comes in but his sort of like presentational style where he'll like look to the camera like wasn't that so awesome that basically he's looking at jennifer aniston and saying like, wasn't that so awesome, <laughs> Jennifer? Like, don't you want to go on a date with me? Like, that's that was the construct. That was sort of the idea behind some of the comedy of him interacting with the camera. Um, so I think now all of that stuff would just get exploded, right? Because there's so much in our culture today and in social media, which is about like becoming a star which is essentially what that means like I want to right. date with Jennifer Aniston is like I want to be famous so I can you know whatever um so I think there would be a lot I think you know there, there's been a lot of conversation about like could the show exist now like in the w- current world that we live in and I always like my smart ass answer to that is do you know how much money the office has made? Like, yeah, it could exist now. Like, that's my smart. But I think also, I, I think it, I think some of the comedy would be adjusted slightly. And I think right. that really the show was attempting to expose slash lampoon um, a, a certain part of society that maybe was not evolved in terms of race or healthcare or office politics or gender equality or uh, sexual orientation equality or, um, you know, it was sort of poking at that. I think the office now would have a lot of fun with uh, woke people too. Like I, I think, I, I think the pendulum would, would hit yes. both, both sides a little bit more. And you could see um, you, you could see some some poking at, at that side of the bear as well. Yes. It's almost like you just need to pull up another desk and like insert two more characters. <laughs> right. That's right. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I'm not talk gonna talk to you about the chili. So there. So moving on. I feel like everyone wants to talk to you about the chili and I just, I pride myself in, you know, being different. (laughs) Well, anyone that wants to talk about the chili, mm, I just didn't. (laughs) So, so here's a question for you. Have you come across anyone who turned down a role in the office and they're like, if I had only, cause in this comes up because my husband was watching something and he said, he's watching an interview with Matt Damon who turned down Avatar. And he said that was his biggest regret is turning down that movie. Cause it was like $260 million role or something. And he said, right. you know, I just wasn't into it. And so do you know of anyone? I and mean, we probably can't even talk about that. Can you talk about it? Do you know of anyone who's like, oh my gosh, I shouldn't have turned down a role? No, I, you know, the closest that I can think of um, 
was when Steve Carell left um, and they were kind of trying to figure out what, what, what happens now. And there was a large discussion about like, we've got 12 people who at this point are all character, you know, within the office mm-hmm. that over the seven years have now evolved to a place where, you know, we want to see more from those people, right? So there was a, there was kind of a contention that was like, we don't need to bring in somebody else. There was another, you know, uh, the network had sort of changed ownerships and they saw this as a formula where they needed like a big star, even though Steve Carell was not when the show started, but that was kind of what the show had become. Um, I know that they talked to a bunch of people then that it that did not come in which is not exactly your question but like no it's close enough we were all, we'll they, roll with it <laughs> i know they talked to i know they talked to james gandolfini i know they talked to julia louis dreyfus um at that point um so there were several at that point that you know i don't know that offers were made or whatever but i will tell you this which is maybe more interesting um you know, the show, when it started, right, there were like four or five, um, what they called series regulars, right? So people who had a, you know, signed a seven year contract on the show, that's how it works, by the way, if you, Mm -hmm. you Mm -hmm. sign on for a show, you sign on for seven years. And the show, you know, was struggling in the ratings. And so myself, uh, Leslie David Baker, who played Stanley, Angela, who played Angela, Oscar, who played Oscar, Kate Flannery, who played Meredith, Phyllis Smith, who played Phyllis. Um, you, you know, I'm probably missing somebody right now, but uh, that was pretty good memory. Um, <laughs> we were we were basically week to week, right? So we were, you know, it, it, it was sort of assumed that we would be back and no one was saying anything else, but we did not have the seven year contract. Um, until a little ways into the second season. And I had a friend, well, I'm not going to mention him by name. Come on. (laughs) No, but, but who said to me, you need to get off that show. You you need to, you need to, you need to go. You need to like, they're not, you know, they're not stepping up to you. You should get off the show. And I was like, I don't know, man. I think what's happening is really special. And you know, I think it's just needs to establish itself. And anyway, that was a, that was a wise decision by me, That's by the way, it, to not wow. do that. But, but yeah, at the time it was like, well, you know, you're not, you, they're not beholden to you. Well, you're not beholden to them. So why don't just go get another show? Um, <laughs> Can you imagine and, that like friend would so be easy. no more, like no more yeah. holiday cards for that yeah. friend. <laughs> like if you had listened to him, you'd yeah, be in therapy. Exactly. Exactly. Today I and, will not blame him for my bad choices. <laughs> yes, exactly. Oh my gosh, amazing. Well, and actually, and so one more. I could, this was like a three pronged answer that just occurred to me. <laughs> Steve Steve Carell talked about um, in the sh- it, um, with me in the podcast that um, he got a meeting to come in and meet, and you know he wasn't a big star at the time, and there was another NBC show that he was kind of working on, and and. Um, Paul Rudd, Paul, Steve called him out. So I can call him out. Paul Rudd oh, my heart. Said, to, said to Steve, don't do it. Oh, don't, they're going to screw it up. The British version, <laughs> it's going to be terrible. Don't do it, man. Trust me, don't do it. So yes, in terms of that, Paul Rudd told, Paul so I guess Rudd. Paul Rudd wouldn't have, uh, wouldn't have come in, but uh, yeah, Paul Rudd told Steve, stay away we were just well that's so funny I, I think it's so weird how the universe works i literally watched this is 40 two nights ago and paul rudd's in that it's one of my favorite movies but i realized i love that movie because i first saw it when i was in my 30s and now that i'm in my 40s it's really not that funny <laughs> it's not that funny <laughs> it's no. not that funny i'm like, no. i'm watching it with this my husband what... and we're just like oh shit <laughs> yes yeah, the 40-year-old virgin, very different from this is 40 in terms of the uh, 
right. tone. A lot of the same guys involved, but yes, very different. Right. Okay. So the accent, my son, James said, do you think, uh, do you think Brian's going to have the same, does he talk like Kevin? And I said, you know what? I don't know enough about this and I'll get back to you. And then I started listening to your podcast. Like I said, I was a fan of the office. I didn't know there was all this lore. Um, yeah. and, and I said, no, he doesn't talk like that. And he said, oh, okay, well, can you ask him why he did on the show? <laughs> So yes. how did the how did the the voice of Kevin come come to be? You know, it 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 definitely was a um it, it it definitely developed. So the the original okay, so backing up. So the the office <laughs> was based on a British version of the show also called right. The Office. And there were um let's call it six, uh, six to seven characters from that show that were sort of translated over. It was much smaller ensemble, not nearly as many people. It only ran 12 episodes uh, and one special. So it was just a different, different thing. And, um, and you know, there was the, the um, Tim became Jim and Dawn became Pam and David Brent became Michael Scott. And, there was a character Keith in the British version of the show who became Kevin. And so, you know, I think for all of us, at least those of us who had seen the show, that's sort of where it started. And, um, and so Kevin started out as Keith and, and the, the casting description for Kevin, the breakdown when they wanted to cast Kevin, they said the only remarkable thing about Kevin is that he is remarkably unremarkable. And that's sort of where it, it started. And then, you know, as the show started to go, I mean, even in the first season and, and definitely moving into the top of the second season, the writers really became a fan of this childlike, call it, uh, sensibility that he had. Um, and, and so the, they started writing more and more for Kevin and, and in a kind of a different way. And it just evolved. I don't know. I was a theater actor. And so, you know, um, which obviously very different from guys who were doing stand, came from stand up or improv or whatever. You know, for me, it was really about oh, we're going kind of nerdy here. So no, I was but, I was going to ask you um, this. So good. Yeah, such a like good podcaster. It, you should podcast. You know, I mean, <laughs> has anyone it, told it, you that? It, 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 for me, what was what's interesting is really uh, character construction. So, like, and and Rain Wilson and I on the podcast actually talked about that because he and I were the two who were, you know, we were doing Chekhov and Shakespeare, and you know, like we were doing straight theater in in you know fairly large theaters around the country and. You know, for us, um, and I think if you go back with that lens and watch it, like um, the physicality of the characters yes. um, were, were different from us. I mean, I really thought there was a place that Kevin's jaw was and there was a way that he moved and a way that he sounded based on all of that, that, you know, developed some over time, but was basically construct. All of that stuff was sort of important. So I didn't really think think of it right like as I'm gonna do a voice it was more just like this is how I believe this guy sounds and looks and I think it was Mindy Kaling who there was a joke that she loved that she wrote like three or four times um, and I'm not going to be able to think of a specific example but you know the pace with which Kevin talked and how <laughs> right. he began, how he talked to other people was different. And so her like favorite joke became, became like, we need to find an a excuse or a reason that Kevin has to talk really, really fast. So like that, <laughs> I think it was her. I don't know. There was some writer. I think it was Mindy who thought that was hilarious. So there would be like, something would be going on and then it would, you know, say like spoken really fast. There would be like a, just a ba -ba 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 thing from Kevin. And she thought that was hilarious, but um yeah but that that was um that it was just the way that I looked at it and I guess still look at at creating a character it's 
you know, the way he sounds, the way he moves, the way, you know, he talks, the way he listens, all of those things are just different. Yeah. I mean, when I watched it back, I thought there, this Kevin guy, like he doesn't exist anywhere except everywhere you go. You know what I mean? It's like, you can look at the character and think this guy, and then you go to the grocery store and I can say Publix because you're from the South. You can go to Publix and there, there's a dude who's just straight out of Kevin. That's Kevin's uncle. (laughs) Right. No, totally. Yeah. Yeah. So what part of Georgia are you from? Atlanta. Atlanta. I mean, the, the, you know, the metro area. I grew up in Sandy Springs. We're in Roswell. See? Okay, very close. Very close. Very the close. neighboring town. So you, are close. your people still here? Um, honestly, no. They've all now left. I mean, my sister, uh, well, like you, she's a lawyer. She went to uh, school in, in Georgia uh, at Emory and went to law school in Georgia. Never lived outside. And she has uh, recently <laughs> moved away, although she may be moving back. Uh, and my parents have retired to South Carolina. So I have no one in in Atlanta anymore, but maybe we so. moved away. We moved up to Boston and came back. We just got back a few months ago. I don't okay, know. Well, so where are you living now? I am in Southern California. Not your like address. <laughs> uh, yeah, if you want. Yeah, you look that's actually that's a joke. I always that's a joke. I always make too. That's very funny. Oh, that's that's funny. very funny. Where do you live? Where do you live? Uh, no, what's your address? Like what? What street? It's like when you sell yeah. something on Facebook. Well, you, Where's you your bedroom? Upstairs or downstairs? <laughs> I was so, I got, Do I sell stuff on Facebook? No. No, no. I, don't I was sell just going to say, I do sell stuff on Facebook. Like if I have some okay. shoes, I don't want to put them on Facebook. And people will message you and say, Where do you live? And I'm like, Well, I know you have to come here, but you haven't said you're buying what I have yet. You know, and right, it's this right, weird right. game. Like we live on this corner and they're like, Wow. Anyway, right. I digress. Um, so I have a whole lot of questions for you. And here's the funny thing. Your people reached out to me and they said, do you have any prepared questions? I said, no, I don't prepare questions. And then I went down the road. I posted something on social media. My friend from high school, Jennifer Durden said, oh my God, I love his podcast. I love, I pre-ordered his book. I have, and she said, can I help you in any way? I said, yeah, prepare some questions for me, which I never prepare questions. I just talk to people. And so I have pages of things. I love that. I from, have no problem. From you can Jennifer. ask whatever you have. There you go. Good. And so I told her as payment for helping job. me, I know I'm such a slacker. So as payment for helping me that I would ask Brian to say hello to Jennifer and her son Wyatt. So will you say Hi, hello? <laughs> hello, Jennifer and Wyatt. Thank you for pre-ordering the book. That's fantastic. I know, isn't it? Um, and uh and thank you for listening to the podcast. Thank you. But How I did want to um oh gosh he's he's a little older than mine i don't know why so Wyatt, if you're listening and i got your age wrong like nine twelve somewhere in there like baseball age you know like little league age um but i'm not gonna read you a bunch of the questions but i did want to read you the beginning because this is just her i know who you are i watched the office but she's a very big fan and she wrote this intro paragraph and i want to read it to you because i think it's just so awesome. She goes, first and foremost, Brian is a fantastic interviewer and host. I have listened to several rewatch podcasts of shows I like, and eventually I stop listening because most don't have the chemistry that Brian has with his co-stars, the office writers and producers. His personality and love for others involved in the office shines through in both an oral history of the office and the office deep dive podcast. It's like they're just hanging out and having fun. She was That's just sending so nice. that to me. And I said, you know what? I'm going to tell Brian that because, you know, can I'd I, like to can know I that. put that on my bio? Actually. <laughs> I think that put that, that under would be, recommendations that would recommend. Yeah. Special skills. Uh, thank you. That's very, very nice. You know, I, I, I love, I have loved doing it. I really have. I, I, and you know, I, I was always interested in, the bit, I talked about this a little bit, but I haven't really talked about this that much uh, on the podcast because it's really not about me, but I, I became very interested in the business of television and how it works. Like it's, it's mm. truly interesting to me. And so, you know, I was just sort of 
boring everyone with like my ideas about character construction or whatever. And that's really where I came, you know, that's where I came from. But as I moved, my career moved from theater into film and television, I just became truly interested in, in that. And so um, it's not just now, but when the show was going on, like Kevin Riley, who was the chairman of NBC at the time, like I was really interested in what he was doing and the job. And obviously they were not interested in telling me everything that right. was going on behind the scenes at the time. But I was sort of following that and the ratings when we were struggling and why certain things were happening. And, um, you know, one of the things that I said early on you know, there's a, there, it's a weird, it's like, it's like the worst kept secret that everybody forgets. It's, I don't even know if that makes sense, but like the Nielsen ratings back at, in the time, and it's still true today, right? Is that it says 10 million people are watching this show at this time, right? That's what it says. And you go, well, no, they're not. Like, how do you know, right? Like it's based on, they're not, they don't have a like an antenna on your cable box and they know what you're watching right or you know because there's no way to know if someone's actually sitting in the room if the cable box is on right like there's no way to track that and so the i'm going to get it to the point in a second but the, <laughs> the they you know so it says 10 million people are watching and you go okay and then everyone thinks uh, you know everyone sits there and looks at the ratings and did we go up or down or whatever and i was like wait a second but we know that this isn't true right because it's based on a small segment of the population who nielsen whoever that is can ag can agree to let themselves be tracked right so like you have to go to a fam you're a nielsen family and then you you write down like who is in the room watching how old they were you know, all of that's, did they watch to the end, all of that stuff, and then they move on. And that's how, that's how ratings are determined, which is, and then they factor it out times a million or whatever it is. And what I always said, this was me back in the day, right? Like I'm being a nerd about television. I'm like, huh, I'm going to bars. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not hanging out at schools, but that sounds really creepy. <laughs> <laughs> like I'll be, you know, I'll be back at Georgia at the University of Georgia, and it's like, wow, the number of people who are talking to me and coming up to me doesn't really seem to equate to where we are relative standing in the ratings. And one of the things I said was like, college students don't have Nielsen boxes. Like there's no <laughs> right, right. Like and back then, now it's all streaming, right? But back, you know, when the show was going on, it's like there was a TV in the dorm and people would turn on the TV and then they would like watch the show, right? They'd watch right. a sporting event or they'd watch the show, certain shows. And I'm like, I don't think that our show is really being captured in that same way. And really that whole long story is just to say, all of that stuff just interested me. So as I've gone back now and talked to, you know, the guys who are holding the cameras or deciding how the camera would move and where you know, I directed for the show eventually like because I was interested in all of those things how how the element of that camera and it being a documentary really changed not just the way the show looked oh it looks like the cameras are moving around but like no like you're having to interact and is this scene happening do they know the cameras are in the room do they not know the ca are the cameras right. spying on them and so how does human behavior change when you're trying to hide from the camera or you're trying to, as I talked about Jennifer Aniston, impress the camera, you know, the people watching or whatever, like all of those things are interesting. And so on our show, that stuff was just fascinating to me. So now to go back and to talk to hair and makeup people about the look of the show or, you know, to guys who came from improv or stand up or, you know, like rain and, you know, so kind of straight theater or whatever, like, all of that stuff is just really interesting to me. So thank you for the compliment. Wow, we're, we're coming all the way around. But also it just, it's been really fun for me um, to, to have these different kinds of conversations. I love podcasting. I mean, I've been doing it for years and years and it's so fun to just talk to people. <laughs> and it's like, oh, I just do this all the time. Just go get someone off the street. Not that you're off the street, but you know, just because people Basically. have amazing stories and, and, you know, funny, you, you kind of went on that tangent about what you did and it was great. But 
I can, here's a tangent for me. My husband and I were watching TV the other night and the Apple TV went off and there was static and he goes, that static's not real. And I was like, oh, you're right. That static's not real. Why do they still feed us static? We don't have a cable box. What is this? And so we like Googled it and it is a thing. Like it, it is programmed to show a static screen on the television because I guess that's just what you expect. That is amazing. Isn't that amazing? But he just, you know, my husband was just sitting there staring. He's like, that's not real static. And I, and first it made me think of something someone at the office would say. I can just like see that being a whole episode, you know? That, yes, no, it absolutely would. That's so crazy. And now my cynical mind goes, why? There's got to be some reason or like no one will pay for it. But like, we're just inundated with ads now. Like it's shocking that it's not an ad for something like that. They, that there's Don't just like, tell them that. Shh. I know, but there should be like, you know, like a, the static is brought to you by down. <laughs> it's just like Downy. floating. Yeah, yeah. But isn't that fascinating? That's back really when we used to have the static, you know, when it was real, yes. it's not, you know, we live in a world where the static's not even real. So that's, you know, what yeah, are we doing? That's that? crazy. Yes. Well, I'm not going to keep you forever. I'd love to, but my final question is, do you believe there's a lot of beauty in the ordinary things? I do. Did I get that right? In ordinary things. In ordinary things. I do. I, I profoundly do. I, I, it's, it's exactly what you just said. I mean, you transitioned perfectly. It's just having a conversation with anyone, um, no matter who they are or what they do, there's something beautiful about that and their story and I think truly that's what that's what the office was about like let's pick the most mundane setting I mean look behind you now that space is like brings like the the feels or whatever right like that's a very nostalgic but I mean if you really look at it it is a unremarkable space look at the cord um, i've watched that cord the whole time we've been talking about the, like, the I, exactly the and all of the paper i mean it's so messy and greg daniels talked about the show um he said uh and i think someone else um told the story that he would talk about to the writers and he was like imagine a giant asphalt parking lot that just goes on and on for as far as you can see. And there's lines painted on that are maybe a little faded, but it's just line after line that looks the same. It's not exactly the same. And then you come across and there's just a little crack in the asphalt. And out of that crack, for whatever reason, there's just a little flower that comes mm -hmm. through. And he goes, that's what we're trying to find on the show. It's just those little moments of unexpected beauty within a world that appears to be monotonous and uh, unending and ordinary. And yeah, I think, um, I, th I think he's right on. I love it. I love it. So tell us about your book. I, we got to get that in before we go. <laughs> um, yeah, just announced hot off the presses. Um, I just uh, finished the introduction, actually, Start, started or began at the end and begin, ended at the beginning. Um, yes. Welcome to Dunder, welcome to Dunder Mifflin, which is uh, a, a series of stories, uh, a couple of hundred never before, before seen photos of us oh, wow. uh, behind the scenes and uh, telling the story of us getting back together and talking about the show and, and what it's become all these years uh, since we started. So welcome to Dunder Mifflin. Available for Wherever pre -order. books are, are, are sold. Wherever books are sold. Not really because it's not out, but <laughs> available for pre-order wherever you can eventually buy a book. And I tell this because I'm an author, buy the pre-orders, people. Don't be like, I'll wait till it comes out. The pre-orders are gold for the authors. So go buy the book. Buy the, the book. People now thank you brian right. this was such an honor I had fun thank too. you it was so fun much, and Meredith. honor <laughs> yes there you go and uh give uh give your 13 year old my best i will i will <laughs>